We are going to kick off tonight's Evenings with Artifacts. We are thrilled you're joining us this evening. We have got a great panel and a great discussion in store for you tonight. Um, we know the holidays are fast approaching, and with the turkey and with all the festivities also comes a lot of stuff. So we are delighted to have three panelists with us tonight. Um, first is Celie Colley. She, Celie is a certified professional organizer of which there are fewer than 400 worldwide. Celie has helped hundreds of students on five continents with her signature online course, The Paper Cleanse. In it, she teaches people how to declutter their paper piles and curate their frustrating files for a lifetime of paper organization. We are also joined by Samara Goodman. Samara is the founder of Samara Interiors. Samara was born and raised in Manhattan, has always had an affinity for elements of structural design and aesthetics. Samara's passion for interior decorating is reflected in the beautifully curated surroundings that she creates. She offers complete decorating and design services for residential locations and specializes in expertly blending a client's heirlooms and existing pieces with new ones to create a truly customized look that reflects the homeowner's personality and style. And we also have Jill Katz joining us as well. Jill is a professional organizer and owner of One to Zen Organizing. She helps people with their mental, physical, and temporal clutter through mindful organizing and productivity coaching. Jill is proud to serve the neurodivergent population and people going through life transitions and is an active member of NAPO, ICD, and ACO. So with that, we welcome our esteemed panel this evening. Thank you for joining us, Samara, Jill, and Seely. And Thank we're you. gonna kick off the conversation. <laughs> We'd love to know, we'd love to start off by if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your business and what led you to your current field and specialty before we start diving into actual tips and tricks for organizing and decluttering. So Celie, if you wanna start. Absolutely, thank you so much for having us. This is so much fun to be here with my colleagues. So um, I am Celie Cauley. I was a residential organizer for 20 years um, and then pandemic. And then I really started to look at my life. I'm going to be 60 next Monday. So I'm getting a little too old to put on my knee pads and crawl around people's basements. So I've transitioned my business to offering my online courses, educational products, um, seminars, et cetera. So it's a lot of fun. And like I said, I can reach people, not that I can just drive or fly to, but all over the world. So it's super satisfying. Excellent. Thank you so much, Celie. And Samara, same question for you. What led you into your current field and your business? Uh, thank you, Heather and Ellen, for having us tonight. Very excited to be here with Celie and Jill. Um, so this is not my first career. I had studied art way back when I was in school, and then I had an entire non-artistic career for 20 years. And then I felt that calling to go back to do something more creative. So I took that scary, um, career switcher leap. And fortunately, over the past 12 years that I've been an interior decorator, I've found that the earlier studies and experience um, weren't wasted. So I've been able to incorporate them into what I do now. And now I do what I absolutely love. And um, I decorate homes that reflect the people who live there. And I get clients to the place where they can feel joy and truly at home in their spaces. Thank you so much. And Jill, if you don't mind sharing a bit about yourself and your business and what led you to your current field and specialty. Absolutely. First of all, thanks, Heather and Ellen, for having me. I'm already having fun with my colleagues. Um, so actually, this is my second career. It's pretty common in professional organizing for this to be a second or even third career. Um, I have a marketing degree, a business marketing degree. And in my former life, I would put together conferences. It was my job to research industry trends and put together a conference based on what people were interested in and then run the conference. So I love research, which is why I enjoyed that. But then when I became a mom, I had a special needs child and I took a break from my career 
And what I learned, which I didn't know, is that organizing is not something that comes intuitively to everyone. So my daughter, who's neurodivergent, had a lot of trouble with what we call executive functioning and planning. Um, so I used my research skills to see what was out there. And I actually taught her these things. Um, and then I started to wonder what happens to adults who are in charge of other people and themselves. And what happens if you're a neurodivergent or you have a child that's neurodivergent is you start to notice people that you don't diagnose, but you notice who might be neurodivergent. And I wondered, how are they organizing their homes? Um, and about that time is when I learned that organizing is a, could be a career. So I started to organize for people who are neurodivergent. And then as part of that journey, I learned that people who are going through life transitions, it's even if they have, they're not neurodivergent, they have trouble because they have to create new habits and routines and they become very anxious. And so I started to organize for people like that. For example, holiday season, new routines and changes. So that could be considered a small life transition. That's great. Thank you so much, Jill, for sharing that. I love your emphasis on mindful organization. I think that's yes. so, for all of us, that is so critical. And I do want to share with our guests who are joining us tonight. We do, Samara, Jill, and Celie, and myself are all members of our local NAPO chapter. And I wanted to share that organizers, when you set a time and a place in the meeting, they are there, you know, on time is late. So we were all on time <laughs> well before this started. So it is, it's fun to have this discussion with um, the three of them tonight. I'm um, jumping up to our next question. I think what's on everyone's minds is what are your tips and your favorite go-to tips for decluttering, organizing, and or creating a welcoming space during the holidays? And Celie, I'd love to start with you on this one. Well, so I teach a course called the paper cleanse. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the paper, right? So the reality is, even though it's the holidays, that doesn't stop the paper from coming. In fact, we get a whole lot more paper during the holiday season. So one of the things I suggest is that everybody create a collection container. And I wish I could give you a link for this box. It's literally two decades old. This is my own personal collection container. It has a lid, so I can actually put a lid on it when people come over. And this lives out in like right as you enter my home, but it's someplace that everything goes. Now, the one thing I might suggest during the holidays, holiday season is to have a separate box to put holiday cards in. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to clients' homes in the past and found a discarded box of mail that they forgot about during a holiday season and found not only holiday cards, but holiday cards with checks that had expired, with money, with gift cards. So I don't, you know, it, this was a while back. I know we're not mailing a lot of that stuff nowadays, but if somebody goes to the trouble of sending you a holiday card, I want you at least to open it. So I'd say maybe create two separate boxes, one for your holiday cards and one for everything else. That is a very <laughs> useful tip, Celie, like one that I think we definitely start employing in my house. <laughs> Now's the time to look for those boxes. That is great. Thank you. Um, Jill, what is your favorite go-to tip or tips for decluttering and organizing and creating a welcoming space during the holidays? It is very hard to choose one. I have a lot of thoughts, but um, what I would say is, first of all, that one should think of what their goal should be and not be a perfectionist. So the holiday times, it's a time to maybe enjoy time with your family, um, maybe create traditions, you know, think about the goals that you have before the holiday and don't try to do everything perfectly. Let go of that. So that would be my first tip. And then my other tip is that, um, again, create traditions. Think about if there are traditions that you had from your family. You might want to pull out platters, special things that just make you feel that holiday spirit. You might want to create new traditions. So those, I think, are very important things. And then the neurodiversity end of it, or just the practical end of it for me is, you don't want all these racing thoughts and 
you know, things to take away from what's important. So try to track in some way some of the routines that you have around the holidays so that you could keep track of it for next year and you don't have to start from scratch. So those are some of my favorite go-to tips. Great, thank you. And Samara, how about you? How do you create that welcoming space during the holiday? Or what tips do you have for our listeners tonight? So what I like to think about and talk to clients about when they're hosting for the holidays or even just when they're home themselves are, are reaching all five senses. So often people think about sight and what it looks like and the trees decorated or the table set. And of course, taste, right? Because you have your Thanksgiving spread and all of that. But I also like to think about, the, you know, touch. So, you know, having cozy blankets that people can just, you know, feel that warmth around them. Um, and sound, of course, it's great if you can have um, music on because it really um, it can set the tone, whether, you know, it's upbeat music, um, fun holiday songs, or if you want to have sort of a quiet, calming time, you can put on quiet and calming music um, or a combination. So that really, the sounds really help set the tone for the welcoming environment. And then lastly, of course, is the smell. You know, you're going to be cooking, but it's also fun to have, um, you know, mulled cider going because that's a great smell, which can, you know, having that that scent really helps people have a uh, memory stick Um and oh, that smells like uh, Christmas at grandma's or <laughs> whatever it is. And so, um, you know, I love that. Um, we recently used um, uh, for decorating a client, just a vase with cloves and cinnamon sticks. And it just smells so fabulous. So just think about all five senses. Excellent. Thank you, Samara. Before we jump to the next question, um, we do have one for the audience that Jill, there's a question about what is neurodiversity. If you don't mind maybe spending a minute or two and sharing that with our members. Sure. I tried to type it in the questions and answers, but I don't know if it went through. Um, but basically neurodiversity is the idea that certain people's brains are wired differently. And a lot of people will say everyone's brain is wired differently because no two brains are the same. But usually it's suggesting the aspect of uh, brains that are wired differently when it comes to executive functioning, which is your frontal lobe that of your brain, which is in charge of organizing. So someone who has executive functioning challenges, they might have ADHD, they might have Asperger's, they might be slow processors, and that means they might have, uh, have challenges that deal with time management, planning, remembering things, um, categorizing, a lot of things that have to do with organizing. I hope that answers your question. Heather, I had one more tip I forgot to mention. Um, so during this season, we are getting inundated with catalogs as well as charity suggestions. So I would suggest that for the catalogs that you don't want, just rip the back off of them and maybe collect them. And See, Lee, I think you muted yourself. <laughs> well, I'm so sorry. I hit it by accident. Um, I was saying that you pull the back of the catalog off and then you can collect all of the ones that you don't want to receive. And then in the new year, you can go to a free site called Catalog Choice and just ask them to be taken off those lists. You'll save a few trees. You won't be um, uh, tempted. I know that um, you know, I've ordered my mother-in-law a few things off of strange catalogs in the past. And then all of a sudden I'm inundated with apple seeds catalogs. And, you know, so I think that that would be a great suggestion. Um, and also just go ahead and set up a folder. I've got mine already that says Christmas and I've already got a ton of stuff in here. We've got tickets to a pantomime that we're going to in Maryland. I've printed those out. Those are in my Christmas folder. I've got my ideas. My last year's holiday card is in here so that I can look at it when I'm ordering my this year's holiday card. So it's not too early to start setting these up. I've got, you know, uh, suggested lists of Christmas gifts for my child. I'm not going to show any more in case she's seeing this. Um, 
and I've already started jotting down ideas there. And then I'll start buying them and writing, you know, checking off if I've received them and how much they cost, because I do also keep track of my budget very closely during the holiday season. I think that's really important. So those are two more kind of paper-based tips that might help people stay more organized during the holiday season. Lee, those are fabulous tips. <laughs> <laughs> And I love that Ellen just shared that her child's gone digital and now sends her Google slides with linked gift ideas. Mine does too. I still wish for that paper though. I miss those paper lists. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Let's go on to, so we know the holidays can make even the most relaxed of us an absolute stress case. You start thinking about visitors and all the to-dos and the decorating and the hosting and see that you noted the gift buying, all of those things that somehow have to get done between now and the end of the year. What do you all, um, what can you do or what, do you, what tips do you have for our viewers tonight? that they could do in advance, I say the month before, a week before, maybe even a day before the actual event if they're hosting something. But how do you help folks kind of map out to reduce some of that stress? And Samara, I'd love to start with you first. Oh, you're on mute, Samara. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things that I always do um, for entertaining for the holidays is I like to set the table ahead of time um, as far in advance as I can be motivated to do it. And I realize that, you know, everybody doesn't have a separate dining table and everyday kitchen table. So the other option that's really good is having a table setting box. And so then you can put all the things you need in that box, your tablecloth, your napkins, um, you know, your candles and candlesticks. And, and that's the time to make sure that those candles fit in those candlesticks, you know, so that the day of you're not like carving down your candles or, <laughs> you know, those last minute things that you really don't need to be doing when company's coming in, in half an hour. And um, there's some things obviously that you can't put into that box. Like, you know, if you're going to use your everyday glasses when you're entertaining for the holidays, then they won't go in there. So then I also make a list or often I'll leave like post-it notes, um, you know, this platter's for this or, and the list, you know, the glasses, um, whatever other things that I can't put in there ahead of time. So that's that's probably my biggest one. And then um, later, I think we'll talk about um, just a more general making holiday decorating easier. Excellent, thank you, Samara. Thanks. So what are your kind of go-to tips, either a month before, a week before, the day before? How do you help people stage and kind of feel some sense of control or at least a little bit of not so much chaos as it lead up to the actual holidays? Are you asking me? Oh, I asked Jill. I'm sorry. Jill. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, well, I like spreadsheeting so much that I use it as a verb, like Let's spreadsheet that. So, and when you were saying about the countdown, I have a spreadsheet. So it's funny. And so Jewish holidays, so there is Hanukkah, but to me, Passover is the biggest Jewish holiday. It takes the most work. And so I find when you have a holiday that takes a lot of work, I actually have a countdown, like four weeks out, three weeks out. That's what it actually says on my Passover spreadsheet. So I think, you know, you need to make it your own, but having something that says, four weeks out, you know, start taking out the decorations or, you know, start rearranging the kitchen or make your shopping list. Think about when you want to do things and spreadsheet the heck out of it. Um, and so what would go on that is taking out your decorations, making room for special things in your kitchen, um, your menu, uh, any traditions, things like that. And um, maybe you might have I don't know if you want to clean the house, if there's something special, if you want to get your carpet cleaned or something fixed, that would go in there. Um, and the other thing is, this is an odd thing, but I think it's helpful to think about, do you want help when the event is happening, when people are over? Do you want some people I have gone to people's houses, they don't want anyone to go in the kitchen and that's fine. Or maybe you actually want help. Or maybe you want people to just chat with you. So I feel like it's important to kind of set the tone. Um, sometimes when I want help, I'll actually put 
as Samara said, post-it notes, we organizers and sounds like designers use post-it notes for everything. When I want help in the kitchen, I actually put post-it notes up, like help set the table, make this salad. And for a salad, you could put a recipe card, the salad ingredients in a bowl. So if you want help, um, which I do often, but if you don't, that's okay too. You just have to let people know. So I think that's thinking about how it might go the day of is also important. I've got a okay. giant smile. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no. So I'm I'm just I'm nodding my head because again, I come from a, a paper-based generation. So I just have pages ready for all of that. And Samara, great minds think alike because on the meals, it's dish or menu item, make from scratch, buy pre-made, that's me, a sign to bring, and the serving dish chosen. And I think that that was exactly what you said. Plan that stuff out a month right. in advance if you can. In fact, for one of my uh, clients, we went through and we just used label tape on the bottom of the platters because that label okay. tape stays on in a dishwasher. And so, so you know, she's like, I always put the sweet potato pot, you know, casserole in this dish. I'm like, let's label it. Let's make it clear. So that can be a super helpful thing. I love uh, Jill's idea about the countdown. Um, a week before, I would definitely do at least a week before my, um, you know, Christmas day of planning, um, you know, timing out when the turkey needs to go in, when other things go in. I'm not really good at getting everything on the table hot. So for me, that's a real mathematics skill. And I don't want to be doing that on Christmas day. I want to have that all figured out in advance. Um, the other thing I really like on the day. So again, I'm speaking from a Christmas perspective. I'm, we're a family of three people, but you would think we are a family of 20 because there's tons of presents, which I know you think sounds strange because I'm an organizer. Well, mm -hmm. it's things like deodorant. It's really just more for the fun of opening presents. But because we do that, we set up in our living room, and I suggest that you do this too. Generally, gift wrap, sadly, is not recyclable. So if, you know, we just have to throw it out, but we... Um, ball it up and throw it behind our sofa. And behind our sofa is a giant trash bin to get all of the wrapping paper. I have a box very similar to this one that all of the ribbon I save from year to year goes in. And then I have another small box like this that all of the little presents go into because gift cards, earrings, tiny, you know, ear uh, ear pod things, those are the, it always is the smallest gifts are the most expensive. And all it takes is to lose one of those gift cards in the wrapping paper. And that really doesn't set the right tone for your holiday celebration. So I'd say set aside one dedicated box for all of those little things that you wrap, have that pre uh, ready. And then I also love a tool like this to open up the plastic clam things or just to open up anything. It's not dangerous like scissors can be, especially some families start drinking early in the day, um, but it's gonna be a safe way to open boxes, tape. So, I mean, uh, really practical <laughs> ideas that are just gonna make your Christmas or holiday morning run a little bit smoother. So that's what I do on the day of. And I just wanted to add one thing to what Jill was saying about the helpers. I also, um, besides, I, I don't do the notes in the kitchen. I love that idea. But I do talk to some of my guests. We do a big Thanksgiving. So I do let my kids know, you know, what they can, are specifically can help with. And, um, you know, one of the cousins always does a particular thing, which we'll talk about later. But then um, my husband's cousin um, loves to help. So I always plan ahead what she's going to help with and um, let her know that that's what she's going to help with right when she comes in the door. And, and so, or even text her ahead of time. So it's, it's already prearranged who's helping with what. 
So Mara, I love that the idea of thinking, customizing, depending on the guests that are coming. I That reminded me of the idea that let's say you really don't want to get into a fight with Uncle Edward and you end up talking about <laughs> politics. I don't know. I'm, I don't have an Uncle Edward. I made that up. But um, that, that idea that maybe you tell someone in advance to help prevent any triggers. If you think about the things that are, you know, you care about spending good time with people, think about those things in advance would be also another idea. So it might be the person who wants to help or it might be the conversation you don't want to have. <laughs> um, I was laughing when Celie was talking because I was having flashbacks to my father, like practically chasing us with the trash bag to put the wrapping paper in it immediately. And we're like, come on, it's fun. It's colorful. But actually the reason he was doing it is um, if you have pets who, that oh. might chew on ribbons or bits of paper, it can be super dangerous at the holidays and they can run off with them. So it's actually another like, if you have pets, be mindful of, of these things too. Um, so I, I was gonna bring that up, uh, but there's also a great question in chat. I'll leave it to, to Heather to grab that one from, me, from Anne. Sure, so Anne wants to know, what if the other people who are part of the events are very resistant to planning ahead? And I laughed at this because in my family, I'm the planner. And I think everyone else is the day of the hour of like, hey, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> this is um, a typical organizing question, right? Yeah. Celia, you go first, but I feel like we organizers deal with this all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think that one either takes it on or one delegates, but it's the trusting of the delegation that is very hard, right? Because you don't want to say, okay, your job is to get the gluten-free stuffing, right? Um, Samara and I, I know she's gluten-free and my daughter has celiac. So that is an essential ingredient. Like there would be tears on Christmas if there was not uh, gluten-free stuffing. So assigning that to somebody you need to you know make sure because it's only in Trader Joe's um, for like three weeks so it, that talk about putting something on the calendar that went on my calendar on um, November 1st because I could not risk that being out of stock but I did it so um, yeah so I think you either have to do it yourself or delegate or de or delete right just be like okay nobody's having stuffing this year um, but <laughs> that's my thought. What about you, Jill? Yeah, I was going to say everything is always a negotiation, right? So if you do it yourself, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> but if you're giving it to someone, they get to do it the way that they want to. Um, and I also think people have different strengths. So some people like to cook. Some people love to clean up. I hate to clean up. My husband, does, I do the cooking and he does the cleanup. But sometimes he takes a little longer than I might have, but that's his thing, right? If he's cleaning up, he could take two days. It's That's his job. So, um, and, you know, I think when it comes to organizing in general, we're always talking about shared spaces. So you can organize your own space however you want, but if you're sharing it, it has to be compromised because we all care about each other. So, and we're all different. Thank you. Um, we've got another question too I want to jump into. This one's for Samara. How do you make decorating easier as you transition through the winter holidays? So um, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that um, I've been doing, especially now that I work so closely with so many organizers, and I know that it's really important not to have more stuff um, and more clutter. So what I've realized is for all the holidays, you really need just a few simple things that can take you year round through the holidays. So I have a couple of props for this, but one of the things that I do frequently with um, clients is, you know, you just have your basic hurricane, right? It's glass. And then you have your candle, white pillar candle. And I have actually a client who has them all on a button and all the candles come on at the same time. Um, but Basically, so so for the fall, you know, there's lentils in here. That's all it is. It's just red lentils. Um, there's, of course, other things you can do. I like to use nature a lot. Um, and I have a whole decor guide about this. But um, you can put acorns in there, that type of thing. Then you go into, um, you know, December and you can fill it with red and green M&Ms or the red and white um, mints, that sort of thing. 
Um, and then you can use the very same hurricane in the winter and put in your little sugar cubes. Oh. And they look like little snowmen. Um, you can also put in things like uh, cinnamon sticks. I hosted a bridal shower last year that was like a lemon theme and we put lemon drops, same hurricane. So just these two hurricanes um, and you can fill them both with the same thing or different things. Um, so there's there's all sorts of um, things in the, you know, it at Easter time or in the spring, you can put in little, you know, Easter egg candies, that type of thing. And I find, you know, you have two glass hurricanes or you have a glass bowl, or maybe you have a silver plate bowl or a silver plate um, tray because you know these are all good containment things and or a basket and that's your one centerpiece um, so I have this here which is a dough bowl that always has these green um, balls in it but at this time of year I have some gourds in there and then in the winter I can have pine cones in there in the spring again I can have the um, spring and summer I can just have you know lemons in there or limes in there so I'm not changing the centerpiece I'm just adding and subtracting these little pieces of it, but you don't have to buy the Christmas bowl or the, um, you know, which I know that my organizer colleagues just don't like, you know, there's just so much of that clutter, but just whatever your beautiful glass bowl, clear glass, silver plate, um, bowl, platter, plate, it contains it and you can just add and subtract. Um, and then I like that all these filler items are actually um, compostable. <laughs> so, so when you're done with it, um, you know, you can just stick it in your compost bin and you don't have to feel like you bought a whole bunch of stuff that um, is gonna clutter your shelves or has to go in a landfill. So that's that's one of my tips and tricks to go through the holidays all year round with without having containment devices changing or your centerpiece changing. It's just tweaking, tweaking what you have. Samara, I think we're kindred spirits. I have this really <laughs> tall glass vase and during the year it has these black smooth rocks and one white one that I found on the beach once. Oh. And then I dump it out. It's terrifyingly loud. And I fill it with brightly colored circular or ornaments um, at, at, uh, at Christmas time. Oh, I love that. And and sand is another great yes. um, filler and anything, you know, you can find all sorts of great stuff in nature, holly, um, pine cones, cool things that come off the trees in the fall or the spring. <laughs> so I, I, love, I love the idea of like, especially because it's inexpensive, a bag of red lentils, a bag of candy corn, a bag of M&Ms. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's brilliant. So and, and, you know, economical as well. Right. It is. It's economical. It's not bad for the environment. So and it doesn't add extra clutter to your house for Jill and right. Sealy. <laughs> Love that. I love that you're bringing nature into it somewhere. That's, I think that's so key. Like I have a lot of um, family in Denmark and there it's all about the nature and the passing of the seasons. And I love how you gave examples to bring that into the house year round. And that's, that's really fun. We'll be implementing some of those, I think in my house too. So thank you. And <laughs> thank so you. there's the decor guide, um, which you can find on my website that just talks about full decor, but I have another one also that's just about vase filler and different things you can fill. A vase with. Um, so it has lots of ideas for different seasons. And I, Celia, I think candy corn is one of them because that looks great in these hurricane yeah. jars. <laughs> yeah. And folks, we popped that link into chat um, for, you can access Samara's the um, fall decor guide and her other design guides on her site. So if you're looking for additional inspiration, she's got some phenomenal resources there. So we do have another question that came and I think this is for all three of you. But how do you handle clutter when you have visitors for multiple days at the holidays and their perception of what's acceptable does not match yours? I'll See, go first. You're shaking your head. Do you want to start? <laughs> I'll go first. So um, I actually did a um, segment uh, channel nine last year on stress-free holiday hosting um, and so much of this. So I've got props as well. <laughs> so you need to think about what you are capable of, but I don't need, I don't want to be clearing out my entire coat closet for my guests. So I recommend that you just on the back of your coat closet, get one of these with like a little welcome. And then they know that this is where their coats go. No, their coat doesn't go on the back of a chair. No, it doesn't go on the banister. And you're like, uh, as they arrive, welcome Smith. There, that's just for you and your coats. 
um, and your handbags and your everything else. Um, the other thing I recommend is if you're a shoes free house that you have a little sign and baskets and that you also provide um, like uh, skid free socks for people to cut, put on in different colors um, and the links are in this guide. Um, so those are two things because I don't want to see your shoes on the floor. I want to see your shoes in a basket. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I love to host. I love to host, but I, I want, I don't want my house crazy. Um, <laughs> and especially if families of four show up and we're just two people now, it can be a little overwhelming, but when people, and people want to know what to do, right? If you say, put your shoes there, they will, but they just need guidelines. And if you can, you know, use like cute chalkboard things, um, especially kids love rules. They love to know what the boundaries are. So those are some things that help, I think. That's an awesome tip, Celie. Jill, what do you have for how do you deal with? Well, it's funny. My mind automatically goes to food. I can't help it. And I was also thinking, Samara, that we couldn't put chocolates in a bowl because it wouldn't last in my house. <laughs> that couldn't be its decor. Um, candy corn, maybe, but not yeah. definitely not chocolate. Um, yeah. So I was just thinking more of leaving, you know, gift baskets or baskets of breakfast items. For me, the biggest time where you feel your guests is in the morning. If I haven't had my coffee yet, it's not it's not so easy to to greet guests. So I I was thinking more of having a setup for them for food. So leaving out pastries or breakfast items, some sort of note, you know, taking out some some plates and things in advance. So in the morning, you're not bothered. To me, that's the biggest thing. Um, I'm not so bothered by those other things, but I feel like it's the same guideline as what Celie was saying is you need to give direction, you know, um, and a lot of people have different love languages. Mine is food. So that's why it goes there. But, you know, you might be someone who loves books. And so you're going to put out books or put books in your guest room for guests, like, you know, if you know someone likes philosophy and nonfiction, you could leave a few good books. I like to do that, too. Um, but I think the idea is that you kind of give direction to what your household is about with signs, slippers. For You know, I've been in houses where people don't want you to wear shoes and they leave slippers. And that is a pretty clear message. So so I, I kind of agree with Celie. Just leave a message and let people know what your house is about. Awesome. Thank you, Jill. So Myra, how do you handle clutter? And when you have visitors from multiple days um, at the holidays and their perception of what's acceptable does not match yours. So I'm really right there with what Jill and Celia are saying. I do exactly that. I have a basket by the front door for um, shoes and I just designate a location. I love the idea of the rack. <laughs> it says welcome on it, <laughs> but I designate um, a spot for the coats the same thing. And um, when they stay multiple days, I make sure like I have a luggage rack in the room. So like, okay, so your luggage rack is in your guest room. So don't leave the luggage, you know, around the house or, oh, I'll carry that down for you. Here's the luggage rack. <laughs> and here's hangers for, you know, the clothing on the clo in, in the closet in the guest room, that sort of thing. So I really set up the guest room um, for success for them um, <laughs> to, to put their items, um, keep their items with them in the guest room. That said, there's, you know, some people absolutely have a completely different um, standard um, of what's, you know, clean or not clean. And sometimes like Ellen was saying earlier, I actually may say something like, you know, we have actually, we have pets. So I might say that, um, well, you know, we have cats. So, you know, you can't leave food, you know, you can't leave the popcorn bowl with some popcorn still in it on the on the table, that sort of thing. So I don't know, blame it on the pets. <laughs> I, I have another thing that I think helps um, when guests come. So I think, especially again, I'm thinking, you know, when a family of four comes and we're a family of two, we just don't have that many dishes and cups and things. So I know you're familiar with kind of the wine uh, charms, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, you can use those on mugs or glasses. So um, I have this little 
again, this little chart that just says, you know, choose your colored wine <laughs> charm, you know, mark plug to mark your, your glass or mug. And again, people like it. They, so, so I'm like, okay, you're going to be green. Okay. You get these two green ones, one's for your mug and one's for your wine glass. And then I also have a, it's literally just a placemat that you can put it back on. So, you know, because you're going to have another cup of coffee and I'm going to want come through and want to put it in the dishwasher. So okay. it, that can live until we transition to wine or we can have it all. So that saves a lot of washing of dishes and getting out another mug and getting out another glass. And everybody knows which one is theirs because they know what the what color they chose. So that's just another really all of my tips are really practical, but it really saves a lot of time and trouble with all of the washing and all of that. And again, people love it, right? They, you know, they'll choose their favorite color. You know, the kids will be like, oh, daddy's going to be red because that's his favorite color. Like, fantastic. You are, and that's their color for the whole visit. No <laughs> switching up on me. So. I also thought of something else. Um just the idea of keeping your eye on the prize, like it's a different standard when you have guests. And again, it's all about goals, expectations. It's just when you have guests, things shift and you have different priorities. And then, um, so we organizers have this term called reset, which means like you put things back the way it was. And there's this idea when your guests leave that you do a reset, you put things back the way they were. You might like, you know, jump on the couch and go, ah, you know, it's the end, but you enjoyed your guests and then you do a reset. So, you know, those few days where the guests are there, it's going to be different and that's okay. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Jill and Celie. And it's fabulous advice and also very, very practical. Like I could see everything you're saying, like, I think I'm organized and then I listen to you all. And I'm like, wow, there are so many things I could be doing better to make it kind of more efficient and definitely less stressful during the holidays. So let's switch gears a little bit and have a fun question for you all. Um, how are you preparing your home for the holidays and any fun traditions or special events, um, things that you do and specifically, how are you managing the people, the places and all of the stuff? So Jill, I'd love to start with you, please. Okay. Well, first of all, I had a sewer backup recently. So my basement is out of commission. So I have to do some moving around. I have people coming for Thanksgiving, more than usual, actually. So luckily, um, my parents are staying here. So I'm using another home. So I'm using my home as well. I just have less rooms available. So um, again, it's just different expectations. I couldn't help what happens. I'm going to get a nice new basement soon, which is a positive, a nice reframing. But um, I'm just going to have to do a little adjusting. Um, but I, my love language is food. So I just make sure to have an extensive menu. Um, there, are pe there are people in my family request certain things um, or help make certain things. And so that's a big thing for me. Um, and also every year we go to this Garden of Lights in my neighborhood. It's a tradition. It's lit up at night. Um, we have hot chocolate, there's trains running, you know, there's a mini train set running through the conservatory and there's music, it's beautiful. And just, we've done it for years and years. So I, I always look forward to that. Thank you, Jill. Celie, how about you? What, any fun traditions or ways that you're managing people, places and things this holiday season? So we're a small family and um, nobody comes for Christmas. So it's just the three of us. My daughter will be flying back from London where she lives to celebrate with us. But we do have um, a calendar, which I have, I keep putting things on because we've been invited to holiday parties and she's having a holiday party at our house. And we have lots of traditions. We're going to the pantomime. That's one of our big traditions. The day the tickets are on offer, we go, we, you know, we sign up and we go. Um, 
we have so many traditions that I have a spreadsheet. And I think that Jill, Jill's mentioning about making notes. Um, one year we went to the Christmas Eve service and I forgot to take the cheese out because on Christmas Eve, we have a picnic on the living room floor and nothing's cooked. It's all cold food, shrimp and pate and cheeses and vegetables and dip. Um, but I forgot to take the cheese out before we went to church. So now it's on the spreadsheet. Take the cheese out. Get ready. So, you know, schedule time to take a family self-time fo family photograph when we're all dressed up before I cry when we're at church, you know, that type of thing. Like I'm and we live and die by that list. And um, it really it it seems kind of regimented. But all of those things are really important to us and having it happen smoothly um, you know, I have a little uh, Christmas traditions list, and we always listen to the Nutcracker during our family picnic. Um, uh, you know, when we're making Christmas cookies, we listen to the Queen's speech in England that she does. So it's just, you know, I think making a note, taking a note and being like, this year, we didn't get tickets in time to get to the, you know, the Lantern Festival or whatever. Next year, be sure to do it. Um, so that's, that's what I think really helps. I don't have to manage a lot of people, but we do manage a lot of traditions. So. That sounds lovely, Celie. Don't expect maybe you get one more this holiday season on your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Samara, how about you? So I differ from Jill. Um, cooking is not my love language. Um, I really enjoy um, decorating for the holidays and the tablescapes and setting up, um, you know, beautiful holiday tables um, for any holiday that I, I can and for clients. Um, <laughs> so um, I will work on the, the Thanksgiving tablescape well ahead of time, but I also um, prepare our Thanksgivings with, with a lot of people, people bring food. So it's also having the list of who's bringing what, um, and the same people bring the same thing each year. So that's really consistent and helpful. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you try and change it up, I might, um, try something new from pre-made food from the store, which I know Celie said earlier, she does that too. Um, you know, just, okay, we're going to do like a little bit different stuffing this year or something like that. Uh, and then, um, Something else that that we that traditionally that we do, which is really sort of a fun thing, is we always, um, for a tradition, um, make homemade whipped cream, and that's like always a big thing with my kids and all their cousins. And we used to have one of the aunts supervise it because you can imagine how messy that gets. Um, but now the oldest cousin um, supervises that for the younger cousins. That's a great tradition. And then the only other thing I would say that I do. Um, prepare for the holidays is the hostess gifts and try and have that sort of, you know, pick one thing and take care of that ahead of time. One of my clients happens to be like a wine expert. So I can reach out to her, get a recommendation for a good hostess gift wine, and then just, you know, buy a, a six bottles of that or whatever I may need. And then it's in the house and it's not a last minute thing. Um, as I'm not an organizer, I'm a decorator, but like Jill and Celia, I like things, you know, planned out ahead of time. I'm definitely a planner. And so I would rather, you know, find out what's a good bottle of wine this year, the hostess gift, have it in the house and just not have any day of drama around that, that type of decision. <laughs> so, so that's, I'm so glad you brought that up. So, um, so recently it, people pointed out to me that some people don't like candles that smell and some people don't drink. So they just end up collecting those bottles of wine and, you know, they turn into vinegar and, you know, as organizers, we really love consumables. Um, so my holiday gift, this, this hostess gift is I just bought at Costco a waxed amaryllis that you don't need to do anything to. They don't need to be watered. And I'm hoping that by December, they're gonna grow into something and I can be like, here's this beautiful amaryllis, right? I mean, sometimes poinsettias are a nice um, holiday Christmas hostess gift. And, you know, I know, I, I'm sure like you, my mother taught me, you need to, you know, hit the doorbell with your elbow because your hands should be full when you arrive at somebody's house with a gift and your food and, you know, so, 
So anyway, I'm excited about these amaryllis, but I'm afraid they're going to be so pretty. I'm not going to want to give them away. So I might have to go buy some more. <laughs> I sort of realized, um, as, as you mentioned earlier, Celie, you know, as you know, I get lots of um, gluten products and that's, and that's I'm totally fine with me. And I feel the same way actually about wine. I don't drink wine. Um, there's always going to be something like a poinsettia is, is poisonous to pets. Right. Right. Um, so I feel like if someone doesn't like the wine or the plant or the cookies, they can re-gift it. But, you know, right. something that's, I agree with you, something consumable, um, Oftentimes, um, not at the holidays, I'll bring like thank you notes or little note cards, pretty note cards. You can use it up or again, re-gift it. <laughs> something simple and not, um, you know, not something that's like my specific taste or something that would be hard for them to re-gift. <laughs> right, right. But we're all um, proponents of re-gifting and so many people aren't. Yes, one of the things that I think is pulling this all together for me this evening is I, I think traditions also provide sanity for us, right? Because there's fewer things we're trying to reinvent every time we're getting prepared for the holidays. And I think that with the spreadsheeting and with the, the timing things out, one thing I that strikes me about this is being very intentional with it's one new decor thing. It's one new recipe. It's one new, like maybe being very intentional about what's different this year. Um, and, and I'm going to pop into chat. One of our, uh, one of our advisory board members, she has the most beautiful tradition. And I think org organizers and people that don't want more stuff are going to love this. Here's the artifact. Every year, the family works on a new painting. They paint over the existing painting and it hangs there all year round. Everyone gets one swish with the paint. And so they have new artwork to enjoy all year round, but it's not creating new artwork every year that we have to figure out what to do with. Um, in my family, we like to introduce a new recipe each year and try it out, something that's thematic. And, and so actually here at Artifacts next week, we have uh, um, a guest, uh, a, colon, a chef who has brought, given us a couple of recipes that we're, we're going to be allowed to republish and share. But I think that that that's also part of the organization is, is limiting how much new you're trying to tackle and just enjoy. I have to say that people with eight, so that's something people with ADD sometimes struggle with is trying all the things. Um, and I, I like that idea, Ellen, of just in moderation. So you can have some of the things, but you have to choose. You know, you 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 can't have an extensive menu that you're cooking and go to 10 parties and have 20 guests and create 20 new traditions. You kind of have to decide either, you know, do something big or try new little things, but you know, you have to do moderation. And I think to your point, Jill, when I look at this calendar for December already, and I know that there are other things that aren't here, I think I need to plan, if I know we're going out one night, I know we need to stay in the next night. I need to conserve my energy, right? Or I'm not going to be able to enjoy the holidays. One of the things I've done consistently for years now is I always take the first week of uh, December off. Um you know, when I used to work with clients, I didn't book clients. Now I'm just really trying to make sure that I don't have any responsibilities so that I can really enjoy the preparation because the preparation for me is half the fun, right? Yep. Choosing the gifts thoughtfully, writing on the Christmas cards. That to me is really important. But if I'm doing that in a frantic way, then it just sets me up for misery. So I want to set myself up for success. So scheduling out that time, it seems not very romantic, right? But it's it's sensible because I know that what my energy levels will will hold. So I think that that's another great point as well. And and to that point, Celie, I know um, that you and other organizers have packing lists because so many people travel at the holidays. Yes. So having those packing lists also around the holidays helps you just not like chill, like you're saying, it's not so many things. It's the packing list. This is the warm weather packing list. We're going, this is the cool weather packing list. I just did that today with a client. Right. The packing it, list it, today. Yes. <laughs> See, I've learned so much from you guys. And and I will say that the um the other thing that I implement year round um is something that Celie calls um tiny time. And you can explain it, Celie, but I I have to say that has been um 
such a, a change game changer for me. Um, How do you do it? It's always in the kitchen when I'm waiting for something to cook. And then yeah. I'm like, you know what? I have tiny time. I can also load the dishwasher or pay this bill or make this phone call or um, feed the cats or what, whatever it is, something that I could be doing later, but I have my tiny time. I'm waiting for something to cook, even if it's just 30 seconds in the microwave yep. or something else I can do. Yep. That's, that's, that's the whole concept. It's just like, you're already, you're waiting to warm up your coffee for 30 seconds in the microwave. Mm -hmm. Put the four dishes in the sink in the dishwasher. Exactly. It just keeps moving things. It's like never walk, you know, waitresses, servers, never walk into a room empty handed, right? Same mm -hmm. thing for us. Um, but I think that that really can apply, especially at the holidays, right? Mm -hmm. Can you, it's, it's the idea, is it faster to batch? to wrap all of your gifts at once or is that just going to put your you know do your head in and it's better to just buy a gift wrap it hide it if you're hiding gifts be sure to write down where you've hidden gifts oh I have a little story so <laughs> speaking of um, contractors bags I had a client who had all of her gifts wrapped and hidden in her um, shed in a contractor's bag and I think you might know where this is going. Her yeah. husband thought it was heavy leaves that she put in there for some reason mm -hmm. and literally dragged it out to the curb. Thank goodness. She was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm cleaning up. It's the holidays. She's like, that's like hundreds of dollars of I'm like next time you need to let him know it was the only place she could think of to hide the gifts was the one place that intrigue you know intriguing minds would not go looking um yeah mine was the trunk of my car just as an <laughs> fiy so <laughs> I'll share that my mother was always the one to hide the gifts and then there are some years like years and years later we would find a hidden gift oh yeah yeah, we my my brother still remembers one year she bought him a Nintendo. I forget if it's a sixty four or what it is, like a fairly big gift for to forget. And we found it. I think it was four or five years later, and it was just it was the funniest. And that's like now that's one of the family stories we always tell during the holidays. Right. Remember when mom did? Right. But it's that whole you've got to remember where you put it if you choose to hide it. <laughs> 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 Ellen, I that's, think that's the difference between Hanukkah and Christmas because Hanukkah you need many days of gifts so you actually have to write out what you're giving each day so you remember to give it as opposed <laughs> to all at once so I, I actually have to write out okay Monday these are the gifts Tuesday so it's less likely to happen <laughs> oh my I, I admit that I do keep a spreadsheet and yeah. it's being a former CFO, I've got it tabulated and color coded. We're good to go. So yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to say we are up on time. This has been oh. a delightful conversation, Seely, Jill, and Samara. It's flown by. Thank you it's so good. much for your expertise and your tips and your tricks. As I said before, there are so many things that I'll be doing differently this holiday season after having this conversation with you all. So thank you for sharing that. Um, to our viewers, we will be posting this recording on our YouTube channel. So if there are things you want to go back and see or maybe re-watch, um, if you're busy taking notes and catch everything, you can have the um, recording on our YouTube channel starting tomorrow morning. We'll also include all the links back to Samara, Jill, and Celie's businesses and the resources they provided, like Samara's fall guide and Celie's calendars and note templates and list templates. Um, so please feel free to check those out. And last but not least, next week, we wrap up our final evening with artifacts for our fall series we'll be joined by a father world traveler and serial downsizer who's going to share his tips on how to survive downsizing not once but twice over the past three years so with that we thank you very much for joining us tonight um, we look forward to seeing all of you next week thank you samara jill and Celie. thank you so thank much you. for having us yeah. take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.